Grace and peace. My name is Reverend Dr. Jonathan McReynolds. I'm the senior pastor of the Enon Missionary Baptist Church. We are a loving church, a family church. We invite you to come and join us for worship at 175 Genesee Street every Sunday at 1030 a.m. to find and connect with God, connect with us, to connect with the kingdom. We encourage you to take a new look at an old friend. We are a loving church that blesses the community, connects with the community, and we want to help you become connected to Christ. Come on Sundays at 10.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. for our worship service and on Mondays from 6.30 p.m. to 7.15 p.m. for our Bible study. We want to bless your spirit. We want to fulfill your ministry needs both in person and in a virtual format. May God bless you, and I am excited about your future. These are your weekly announcements. New discipleship classes will start on Sunday, March 27th at 9 a.m. in Murphy Greer Hall. For anyone who has joined and never had a chance to attend or completed the classes. Alpha is back. Alpha Drama and Performing Arts Ministry will begin on Monday, March 14th, immediately following Blast. Triple A Praise Dance Ministry will have rehearsals beginning on Monday, March 14th from 6 p.m. until 7.15 p.m. New members ages 18 to 35 years old are welcome to join. Please see Lady Clarissa Likely for more information. The Empire Baptist Missionary Convention of New York Incorporated, Congress of Christian Education, will be hosting its annual sessions. Virtual classes will be held Monday evenings, March 21st through April 18th, 2022. And in-person and virtual classes, seminars, and worship sessions will be held April 19th through the 21st, 2022. Good morning, Enon. You don't want to miss Enon's Men's Ministry in Action as we present Men's Night Out on Friday, March 25th, from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Food will be provided from the Dinosaur Barbecue as we watch an inspirational video discussing relationships. There will be prizes, and we ask for a donation of $25. The deadline for tickets is March 20th. Please see Deacon Terry Brown for tickets. Hi, boys and girls. This is Miss Sweet Potato Pie with a pinch of cinnamon and a dash of sugar. Magic is always in the air. Hope to see you every first Sunday here at Enon Baptist Church for Miss Sweet Potato Pie Children's Story Time. I hope to see you there. We have a special guest. Our first lady is coming down to visit us in Children's Church Story Time. So make sure that you're there and make sure you don't miss our book that we're reading. It's called Homemade Love by bell hooks boys and girls make sure you're there don't forget every first sunday with miss sweet potato pie don't miss the fun bye bye do you have a need for speed but not too much speed the transportation ministry is looking for church drivers please see brother wilbert jackson if interested but now watch it we don't need you speeding and getting us a ticket <laughs> These conclude your weekly announcements. Good morning. Good morning. What day is this? Oh, that was just pitiful. What day is this? This is the day that the Lord has made. And he has blessed me and you to see it. Woo! That in itself is a blessing. Amen? That in itself is a blessing. We welcome you this morning to the Enon Missionary Baptist Church located at 175 Genesee Street, where we are under the leadership of the nine other than the Reverend Jonathan Jamal H. McReynolds, whom God 
has sent to this house, this house, and all of you that are out there in TV land watching and listening, we welcome you this morning. And all who are in the house, let them know out there that you welcome them too. So now I'm gonna ask you one more time, what day is this? This is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice in it. Listen, if you were not able to get up this morning, you might be laying somewhere moaning and groaning and wishing that you had a chance to get up and praise the Lord. Now, if you've ever had that time where you couldn't get up and you were just laying there moaning and groaning, let your memory come back to you and let's get on up and begin to praise God. Not me, but praise God for his goodness and his mercy that you're able to stand up this morning. You got the activity of your limbs. You are breathing. Hallelujah. And the word of God says to us this morning, I just want us to get in that worship mood. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Where's your help coming from? He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Neither he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Wake yourself about your slumber, because the Lord is not sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. You're never alone. The Lord shall preserve. Preserve. Somebody know what preserve means. Thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forward and even forever no more. The Lord is great and greatly to be praised. The psalmist says, praise ye the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the thought and harp. Praise him with the timbre and the dance. Praise him with the string instrument and the organ. Praise him upon the loud sounding cymbal. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbal. If you're not breathing, don't worry about it. You can't do this. If you're not breathing, don't worry about it. But it says here, let everything, let everything, let everything, let everything that has breath, praise ye the Lord. You're not on a respirator. But if you don't know how to praise God, you might be. You might be on a spiritual respirator. I don't want to be on the spiritual respirator. I want to give him all that I got. I want to praise him while I'm yet alive. Woo! Hallelujah. Father, we come this morning to give you thanks for our gathering one more time. That red love that runs from heart to heart that you have given and increased within each one of us. That we are able to be here in each other's presence. Father, we just thank you this morning. We thank you for what you have done and what you continue to do. We thank you for the fellowship this morning. We thank you for the house of praise that we can come in and give you praise. Oh God, we just thank you. Woo, we thank you. 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 Many things are going on, 
but it says you we shall not be smited by day nor night and that you are keeping us oh god many things are going on in this world but you know all about them we've come now asking for your mercy have mercy upon us oh god have mercy upon those who think that they are right but do wrong have mercy upon them give us understanding light and encouragement in jesus name we do pray we will now have a scripture followed by the morning hymn. God bless you. Good morning. Good morning scripture is coming from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are his people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, 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 if only you would hear his voice and do not harden your hearts. This is the word of God.
The more the sun shall rise. Come on, everybody. Holy, holy. Oh. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Mercy, mercy. God in, God in, we pray. Blessed Trinity, come on. Blessed Trinity. Come on, give God a praise, everybody. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. The song says, I worship you, almighty God. Amen. There's nothing like him. Look at your neighbor and say, there's nothing like him. Come on, tell somebody there's nothing like him. I worship you, I worship you. I worship you. Almighty God, Almighty God. There is, there is none like I worship, I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. Oh, Prince of Peace, oh, Prince. Prince of Peace. That is what I long to do. Come on, that, that is what I long. I give you praise. Almighty God. Almighty God. There is. None like you. None like you. I worship you. I worship you. Almighty God. There is none like you. I worship. I worship you, oh Prince of Peace. Come on, that. That is what I long. I give you praise. I give you praise. For? There is none like you. Come on, none like you. Come on, none like you. Come on, sopranos. Search all over, come on. Search all over, can't find nobody. Come on, search. Search all over, can't find nobody like you. Come on, Soprano, search. Search all over, can't find nobody. Come on. Search all over, can't find nobody like you. Out of search. Search all over, can't find nobody. Tenors, come on, come on. So star over can't find nobody. Come on. So star over can't find nobody like you. So star over can't find nobody. Hallelujah, church. Let's put it all together. Put it all together. So it's all over. Come on, church. So it's all over. Come 
about what the Lord is going to do. Amen. I've been preaching for the last few weeks in a series about shifting, life shifts, it's time to shift. This will be the last sermon in this series. I'm grateful for your feedback and your prayers because so many people have said how this sermon series has blessed them in their lives. And that's why I'm grateful that I have enough sense at this juncture in life to listen to the Holy Ghost when he tells me what to preach. And I don't just preach uh, what's a good sermon or what's on the liturgical calendar, but try to hear from God. Amen. Uh, amen. Today I want to preach from the topic of repositioning. Repositioning. Look at somebody and say reposition. I would like to call your attention to the Old Testament book of 1 Kings, chapter 17, verses 7 through 16. A familiar passage of scripture. 1 Kings, chapter 17, verses 7 through 16. And it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Y'all look mighty good. Amen. It's, it's a lot of y'all in here today. Amen. Amen. Both balconies, overflow, main floor, choir sound good, amen. I was tuning them up and praying for them this week, amen. Let's give our music ministry a hand clap of praise, amen. First Kings chapter 17, beginning with verse 7, I'll be reading to you from the New King James Version. And it reads as follows. And it happened... After a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it 
and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the, Lord, the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Repositioning, repositioning. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to stand and share in your word. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would minister to us today. We pray, God, that you'd open ears, open hearts, make minds receptive to your holy and your righteous word. For Lord, we need a word from you today. For we cannot peradventure through life on our own. But we need your word to be a lamp unto our feet. We need your Holy Spirit to speak to us. Lord, I pray today that someone that is lost would be saved. Someone that is disconnected would return to Christ. I pray that the saved would be edified and strengthened in your word. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just fill me with greater anointing that I might be used by you. Lord, we're here not for our glory, but for your glory. And Lord, I pray that as your word goes forth, that the redeemed of the Lord would say so. For Lord, we gather here to learn, to grow, but we also come to worship the true and righteous God. So we pray that the redeemed of the Lord would say so. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Repositioning. The book of First Kings is a compilation of public records from Palestine between the period of 1046 and 616 BC. Various individuals recorded these records in the final compilers were Isaiah and Jeremiah. The books of First and Second Kings became a dynamic narrative of how the Lord's permissive will and providence work in the lives of his people. How sometimes when we are unaware, sometimes unwilling, sometimes not even in anticipation, the hand of the Lord is upon our lives. And his permissive will allows things to come into our lives. His providence leads and guides us where he desires us to go. And it seems like everything in our lives come together how God intends for them to come together. That's why the New Testament writer said all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. The book contains 71 verses of fulfilled prophecy of where even in the midst of tribulation, oppression, and disenfranchisement, the Lord still provides evidence to Israel that he has not abandoned them and left them in 
their time of trouble. I am glad that the Lord works in such a manner because there have been multiple times in our lives when the Lord has reminded us of and provided evidence that even when we are going through, that he is still with us. Somebody ought to be able to say amen because there were those moments in your life when you had tears in your eye, when you were down to your last few dollars, when it seemed like you were about to lose your mind, when it seemed like you had more enemies than you had friends. But somehow in the midst of your situation, while the storm was not over in your life, God still provided some evidence that while you are going through that he had not taken his hand off of you and that he was still with you uh, in the midst of your storm. As a matter of fact, I'll stop preaching for 10 seconds because I believe somebody just got something from the Holy Spirit that just told you that while my storm is still brewing and I'm still going through, God just gave me some evidence that he's still with me. In the midst of my situation. I love the Old Testament narratives as they often display the providence of the Lord and in how he positions and repositions humanity within the scope of his divine plan. While we exist as free moral agents and have the right to make our own decisions in life, the Lord still has a way of keeping his hand upon us and working things in our favor and toward his fulfillment, even if we are not willing participants. The Lord has historically and still works through human instrumentation. However, these divine instruments and movements are contingent upon humanity being receptive, submissive, and obedient to being placed where the Lord desires and to be used how the Lord desires to use us. The book of Kings is a dynamic display of how the Lord positions and shifts humanity to be used for his glory. So sometimes when we're trying to figure out why we're in some situations we're in, why we're in certain places and predicaments we're in, we have to understand from a perspective that we might be where we are because God wants to use us in that situation to provide some glory for him. We all have expressed responsibility, have the re expressed responsibility to understand as we sojourn through life that our lives are not meant to be lived independent of the Lord. We are made in his image and likeness so that we may be used as his handiwork to fulfill his purposes in the world and to give him the glory. Thus we discover through the narrative of kings that the Lord uses many diverse beings in humanity to carry out his will. He uses widows, he uses young children, he uses the wealthy, the poor, he uses kings, others, and watch this trusty man, he even used ravens to fulfill his purpose. Uh -huh. The Lord strategically places people in order to do what he desires to be done in his life and in the kingdom. One thing we must learn as we explore the Lord's hand in anthropological shifts in humanity is that even when the Lord places individuals in certain assignments, situations, and seasons, they are never irrevocably placed. Rather, the Lord reserves the pleasure to position and to reposition us as he sees fit. In other words, we belong to the Lord, and wherever the Lord desires to position us or reposition us, it is his prerogative to use us how he desires desires to use us. That's why somebody in the old church said, Lord, I am yours and I am available to you because the Lord will place us and do what he wants to do. The Bible is replete with examples of how the Lord may position individuals only to reposition them at 
an appointed time. There is nothing with the Lord that is stationary. Somebody say stationary. There's nothing with the Lord that is stationary. Everything under his providence is designed to shift, to move, to be repositioned. The only thing I can think of in the Bible with my seminary education that is stationary that the Lord mentioned was Mount Zion when he said Mount Zion shall not be moved and if your name is not Mount Zion then that means the Lord has the right and the prerogative to shift you to move you to reposition you to plant you wherever he wants to use you for his service look at your neighbor and say neighbor get ready to move because the Lord might be in the midst of repositioning your life I know you've been there for a long time but the Lord might be up to something to do something greater in your life. Uh -huh. Thus we ought to be ready to shift and move if we are not Mount Zion. Look at the Bible. Abram was repositioned when he left home and even had his name changed to Abraham. Noah was repositioned as he built an ark and was transferred to a whole nother location through a flood. Rahab was repositioned as she shifted from being a harlot to a heroine of faith. Saul was repositioned as he transitioned from being an enemy and antagonizer of the church to having his name changed to Paul and advocating for the church greater than anyone else in history. Jonah was repositioned from a rebellious prophet in the belly of a whale to being a guest revivalist in the city of Nineveh. There was a man named Zacchaeus that was repositioned from being a crooked tax collector to being a follower of Jesus. So what does that say? That says that your mind and your spirit and your faith ought to be open because if God can reposition them then there's a funny feeling and hutch in the atmosphere that God might also want to reposition you to use you for his glory I believe in faith today that if some of you here would just dare to get out of self give up control and trust the Lord you will find the Lord will also reposition your life for the better look at someone today and declare that I came here because I'm seeking better in my life uh, look at somebody and say better I pray you didn't come to church and, and have an expectation of remaining the same, but I'm praying that you came to church with an expectation that you would leave here better than what you came. I'm the reverend, doctor, pastor, moderator, bishop, overseer, whatever you want to call me, amen. But I still came here with the anticipation of leaving here better than what I came. Uh, I wish I had some help in here. Let me say it one more time. The problem that we have in the kingdom is we have too many people that come to worship they come to church they engage the kingdom but they have no desire no anticipation to be positioned or repositioned and to leave better than what they came you all not come to church depressed and leave depressed you all not come to church sad and leave sad you all not come to church mad and leave mad you all not come to church angry and leave angry but when you have an encounter with the Lord and the Holy Spirit and the word in your life you ought to leave better than what you came I wish I had somebody in here that just wants the Lord to do something in your life and you desire to leave here better than what you came. If you don't want to leave better, go to brunch on Sunday. Go play some tennis or golf. But when you come to the house of the Lord, you ought to have an expectation and desire to leave better. Uh, that's why the psalmist said I was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the Lord the text today apprehends an individual by the name of Elijah 
who is continually in a state of repositioning. The Lord performed many miracles, wonders, and prophetic actions in his life. However, all of these activities were performed while he was in a state of repositioning in his life. The narrative of Elijah never displays that the Lord used him in one central place that he remained and never shifted and moved in his life. Rather, he was forced to live a a fluid life and existence as the Lord spake and gave him revelation. The Lord moved in his life and performed 16 distinctive miracles and gave prophetic utterances in his life. Yet they all were dependent, watch this, upon Elijah being on the move and possessing a willingness to be repositioned in his life as the Lord spoke to him. If you follow his life narrative as Elijah moved at the unction of God, God spoke to him in different places about what God was going to do and how God was going to use him. My God, some folks won't even change seats in worship on Sunday after 20 years. And you, <laughs> preach Mac, I think I will. You see, here Elijah, he was always on the move. That's why when we came back in after the pandemic, I told the deacons, y'all can sit wherever you want to sit. You can sit with your wives. You can sit in the balcony. You can sit on the front row because sometimes we get stuck because we always sit in the same place. We've always sat and we never move. I liberated some of y'all. Y'all been sitting by that nine worshiping, nine praying person for the last 10, 15. <laughs> Let me hurry, y'all. Thus, it makes me wonder how many miracles we have missed how many prophetic moves were aborted and how many times we miss prophetic revelation from the Lord all because we had an unwillingness to shift, to move, to be repositioned in the kingdom, to try something different in the body of Christ. I've often said in this church, the last words of a dying church are, we've never done it this way before. And thus the relevant question becomes how many times we have placed ourselves in a position of dying all because we have possessed an unwillingness to be repositioned in life. Elijah is living an existential experience of being in the midst of a drought famine and a time of crises however in the midst of what is going on around him the Lord says in his word that he's going to maintain him however it requires him watch this to be willing to move to shift to reposition in his life. The word for someone today is if you're going to survive the atmosphere that you're in today, you must be willing to shift and reposition in your life. Look at somebody and say, you've been sitting there too long. You've been in the same position too long. You've been in the same mentality too long. You've been at the same level of faith and worship too long. You've been doing the same regimented thing in your life too long. But God sent you by 175 Genesee Street to get you to step out of the box, to think different, to worship different, to pray different, to believe different, to believe that God will do something different in your life if you will just be willing to reposition yourself in life. And thus the prophet Elijah becomes a sign and a symbol to us today of how to survive and overcome adverse atmospheres in our lives. If we're going to survive, then we must be willing to reposition as the Lord speaks to us. Somebody say reposition. The narrative comes alive in 1 Kings 17 because the Lord gives Elijah a prophetic word of three and a half years of drought and famine in the land. 
However, while the Lord was willing, as Lord willing, to allow the land and the inhabitants to suffer, he sustains the prophet in the midst of adverse situations. The Lord instructs the prophet in the midst of the drought to go to the brook called Cherith, and he says that he has commanded ravens to feed him there. Look at what the text says. He was in the midst of a three and a half year drought and famine. The, the prophet it prophesied that no rain is going to come, that there's going to be a drought and a famine, and the Lord tells him to go to the brook called Cherith, and the Lord is going to use ravens to feed him there. Thus, Elijah does as the Lord commands. He goes to the brook. He drinks the water and waits and, waits and is fed by ravens daily in the midst of a regional famine and drought. If Elijah had been a Baptist, I'm sorry, he would have never left the brook because the brook was good for a season. Let me say that one more time. Don't y'all look at me because I got more Baptist pedigree than everybody in this church put together. Amen. Fourth generation Baptist preacher. But watch this. Had Elijah been like some of us, he would have never left that brook because he said, I got some water from that brook. Even after the brook dried up, Sister Tiffany, some folks would still be sitting there in a famine, waiting on water. When the Lord has said move, when the Lord said reposition, that's the reason why we have so many dying churches in the kingdom. It's not because of the choir, it's not because of the preacher, it's not because of the deacons, it's not because of the trustees, but it's because people are sitting by dying brooks and they are refusing to move and reposition when the brook has dried up. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but 1978 is not coming back. Don't look at me. I like 1978. I was seven years old. My daddy drove a deuce and a quarter. Had an eight-track player. Don't y'all look at me like y'all know what a deuce and a quarter is. Amen. I had an afro at bell bottoms. I didn't have a care in the world. I had a bicycle with a banana seat in 1978. Life was good. But things had to change. Do I have any witnesses in here? Y'all don't look like you did in 1978. I was a chubby boy with an afro. I, I done come a long way. Amen. But things change. And as things change, you have to reposition yourself to survive. Had Elijah stayed at that brook because the Lord told him once to stay there, then he would have died. We have to understand the Lord speaks to us more than one time. Look at somebody say, he's still speaking. Uh-huh. Just as the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to him once and said, go to the brook, the word of the Lord came again and told him to leave the brook. Am I in the Bible? Why is it that we struggle when the Lord tells us to leave a life position that has been good? Does it mean that we look at our life more than we look at God? Is it that we trust our flesh and our material things more than we trust the one that is the source of our supply? I wish I had a praying church in here. Do we trust what is in our power more than we trust in the power of the Lord? I wish I had just, just about five folks that understood what I'm talking about. Some folks that were raised up in the country down south in Georgia, Alabama, Florida that were raised up and you didn't have nothing but you trusted God and God told you to come north and you ended up in Rochester, New York and once you got here, the Lord blessed you and gave you a life better than what you ever dreamed you could have. Somebody ought to be shouting and hollering like they lost their mind and said if the Lord did it once, then the Lord will do it again. 
Is it that we just fear the process and repositioning the Lord desires to do in our lives from time to time? I can't speak for you, but I trust the Lord enough that I'm not willing to become stuck. Somebody say stuck in my life when the Lord says move, shift, or reposition. Tell somebody the Lord's been too good for me to be stuck. He's blessed me too much to be stuck. He's brought me too far for me to be stuck. He's opened too many doors for me to be stuck. He's healed too many sick is in my body for me to be stuck. He's renewed my mind too much for me to be stuck. He's built too many bridges in my life for me to be stuck. He's turned things in my favor too many times for me to be stuck. I've trusted him. I'm preaching your testimony. I've trusted him this long. I'm not going to stop trusting him now. Elijah, Elijah had enough experience with the Lord to understand when the Lord, when the word of the Lord came to him, it wasn't an optional word, but rather it was a word of life. Either he would reposition from the brook and live, or he would stay at the brook and die. Let me say that one more time. Either he would reposition from the brook and live or he would stay at the brook and die the lord is saying to someone today in order to have life and life more abundantly this is your time to reposition we must always have a willingness to shift and not be stuck too many in the kingdom of the lord are stuck today Furthermore, them being stuck has nothing to do with the devil, adversaries, or haters. Let me say it one more time because some of y'all be lying on the devil. You being stuck has nothing to do with the devil, adversaries, or haters. Being stuck in life to some squarely rests on the fact that they have been unwilling to reposition their lives as the word of the Lord tells them to shift and reposition. Look at somebody and say, I'm not going to make myself stuck because the devil's done too much to me in my life. I'm not going to self-destruct and get myself stuck in a situation that the Lord has told me it's time for me to move, shift, and reposition position my life the Lord sent me here today to tell someone it's time for you to reposition your life it's time to try something new it's time to believe God for something higher it's time to believe that God's word will do just what it says it will do if the Lord says he is your shepherd and you shall not want then you need to just keep following his word and you shall not want if the Lord says he's going to open the windows of heaven then you might have to reposition yourself and in order to get that harvest from the windows of heaven you've got to do something to reposition your life come on somebody say preach man that means you might need to go back to school that might mean it's time to start your business it might mean it's time to buy that new hair weave it might be some time to get a new suit to change up your style or oh, don't y'all look at me like that amen i look a whole lot different pre-pandemic and now amen because i decided to reposition myself maybe it's time for you to reposition yourself so that god can bless you as he desires to bless you. Look at somebody and say, it's time to shift. It's time to shift. Come on, I said put something in the atmosphere. Tell somebody it's time to shift. God wants to reposition your life. I'm getting ready to get out of here, but let me, let me exegete the text just a little bit. The text teaches uh, some valuable principles and paradigms that are essential for our lives and survival. Number one, the text teaches us, Elijah teaches us that every, somebody say every, every assignment and position is seasonal. Ooh, it's dangerous saying that in the Baptist church. Let me say that one more time. 
where my security, amen. Y'all, y'all got me, amen. I got, I got Owen security, amen, right? That, that's the best security in Rochester, Owen security, amen. Elijah teaches us that every assignment and position is seasonal. So that means that whatever you're doing now doesn't mean you're going to be doing it forever. Let me say it one more time. What you're doing now or what you have been doing doesn't mean you need to be doing it or you will be doing it forever. You might have been the choir director in 1980. But it's not forever. You might have been a deacon in 1990, 1965, 19, 2005, but it's not forever. My God, I'm the pastor, but I'm not going to be the pastor forever. I promise you, I wouldn't be my granddaddy or Prince's granddaddy and pastor today, 80-something years old. No, 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 no. I love y'all, but no, I'm going to go fishing like everybody else. Go to brunch, have a mimosa. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. That's, I, I heard him talk about that up in the trustee room. I don't know what a mimosa. I heard him talk about the trustee room one day. Amen. But I'm going to enjoy life because nothing lasts forever. Look at somebody say, nothing lasts forever. Everything is seasonal. And the reason why the kingdom and the church might be suffering is because someone thinks they're on a permanent assignment when it is a seasonal situation. I brought my dancing shoes today. While the Lord maimed him at the Brook Cherith, it was a seasonal assignment at the Brook Cherith. Don't get comfortable by your brook. Tell somebody, don't get comfortable by your brook. Your brook is not your final destination. The Bible says in 1 Kings 17 and 7 that the brook dried up. Isn't that in the text? The brook is a brook in conjunction with the ravens had been the source of sustaining the prophet for a season. Somebody say for a season. We have two many people that are attempting to survive and thrive at dry brooks the brook may have kept you years ago however the brook is now dried up since the brook had dried up Elijah had to be prepared to reposition himself as the Lord would lead him the sad commentary is that many would rather die by old dry brooks, then shift and reposition to a place where the Lord has designed for them to thrive and grow. And I've learned not to get too comfortable on this journey because the Lord is always speaking. I wish I had some help in here. He's always repositioning. He's always, uh, as we talk about in our theology as Baptist folk, he is a self-revealing God. Uh, so he's always giving us fresh revelation uh, about what he's doing and what he's about to do next. Uh, so that means if we are theologically correct as believers, uh, we can never reach an existential place of where we say, I'm going to remain right where I've always been because, baby, that takes you out of tune and out of step with God because God is always evolving he's always revealing himself he's always on the move he's always repositioning those in the kingdom so if you're saying I'm never going to move I'm never going to change I'm never going to shift I'm never going to reposition then you are saying I'm sitting down on God and you're about to cut yourself off from what God wants to do in your life the voice of the Lord drives assignments and repositioning. Thus, we must endeavor to always hear the voice of the Lord. We can't operate just on self, but rather we need to hear a word from the Lord. Point number two, when we are repositioning, somebody said repositioning, the Lord always, watch this, has a plan and a provision. He has a plan and a provision. I promise you I'm exegeting the text. There's always a 
plan and a provision. The repositioning in our lives is never done just for the sake of shifting and moving and doing something different. But God always has a divine plan of what he's going to do in our lives before it even manifests into our reality. Don't think that when you got to a certain date in your life that God waited until that certain date to do what he was going to do in your life. But God in his foreknowledge, he already had some things worked out in your life before you were born, before you even got to a date. I believe today is March 20th, 2022. The Lord already knew what he's going to do in your life today before you even got to this day. I had no idea 10 years ago that I would be in a place called Rochester, New York as a pastor preaching in a church. But God knew way before July 9th, 1971 that I would be standing right here preaching what I'm preaching and that you would be here to hear this distinct word from the Lord because God always has a plan and a provision. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you ought to be shouting right now because the only reason why you are here doing as good as you're doing is because the Lord had a plan and a provision for your life. Oh, you looked at the wrong neighbor. You talked to the wrong neighbor. Look at somebody else because somebody should have hollered like they lost their mind because the only reason why you can leave here and drive that fine car, go to Red Lobster, go to your fine home, go to your job tomorrow morning or later today is because the Lord had a plan and a provision for your life. Somebody say, I'm a product of a plan. I'm out of here in four Baptist minutes. The Bible says in verses eight and nine that the word of the Lord came to him saying, get thee to Zarephath and behold, I have commanded a widow there to sustain thee. Here's what I learned, Reverend Thomas, is that whenever the Lord repositions our lives he's already spoken to individuals and he already has individuals that are ready to hold you up and take care of you I'm trying to preach my best Baptist sermon that I can because when you look at the text that's what unfolds in the text before the brook even dried up, the Lord already had a widow in Zarephath that he was repositioning to take care of the prophet. The Lord not only moves through faith and obedience, but he simultaneously moves through faith and the obedience of others in his plan for our lives. Thus, don't be fearful of your repositioning no matter what or where it is because the Lord has a plan and people prepare to hold you up. I wish I had a praying church in here because I want somebody today to understand that the Lord did not send you here today for you to be comfortable in where you've always been doing what you've always done but the Lord wanted you to understand that this is your day of repositioning. I dare you in the midst of a pandemic, if you know that you've been vaccinated and sanitized, just poke your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, it's time for you to get up and get repositioned because the Lord wants to do something new in your life. Here's what I like about this text when I look at it because the Bible says that as the word of the Lord came to the prophet Elijah and the Lord told Elijah to get up from that dry book uh, and go to the city of Zarephath. Uh, there is no biblical or historical evidence uh, that Elijah knew anybody in the city of Zarephath. Uh, but the Lord had already began working uh, and putting some things in motion. Uh, and that's why I'm not afraid to shift uh, or reposition my mind or my feet in the kingdom of the Lord uh, because I understand uh, that the Lord has a strange and mysterious and spiritual way uh, of working some things out in my life because if the Lord tells me to go to my left he already has my left taken care of before I get there if the Lord tells me to go to my right he already
already has my right taken care of before I get there. And here's what I like about this story. Because when you read the narrative, the Bible says that when the prophet Elijah got to the city of Zarephath and he began to talk and dialogue with the widow, he began to ask the widow for a morsel of bread and for some water. But watch the literary context of the scripture. At the beginning of the interchange, the widow talks to Elijah about his God. She said, as long as your God liveth. Uh, I wish I had some help in here because there is some theological argument that she might not have even been a believer because she's talking to the prophet about his God. She didn't say as our God liveth, but she said as your God liveth. Don't you know that God can raise up anybody when he changes and repositions your life to be a blessing to you? That's why I don't look strange at anybody. The drunkard, the crackhead, the drug addict, the homeless person because God can use whoever he decides to raise up to bless your life. I wish I had some help in here. Yes, even with my Wilberforce, Harvard, United Theological Seminary educated self, I believe a homeless person, God can use that individual to hold me and keep me up. If I have anybody in here that can say, preacher, I know what you're talking about because if it was not for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I would be if the Lord hadn't raised somebody up to give me a cup of water to say a prayer over my life to give me an encouraging word when it seemed like I was going to lose my mind I don't know where I would be but come here Elijah he begins to talk to this widow as the Lord commanded him he has repositioned his life he's no longer at the dry brook but now he's in the city of Zarephath and the Bible says that as soon as he gets in the city that he sees this widow woman at the gate of the city and the Bible says that she's gathering sticks and she says to the prophet that I'm gathering sticks that I might go home that me and my son that we can eat and die but watch how God plays this thing out as he was obedient to reposition his life not only is he going to be blessed but everyone around him is going to be blessed what are you saying Dr. Mack here's what I'm saying that your ability and willingness to shift and move and to reposition your life not only impacts you but it might impact the blessing of others because this widow woman that is even questionable if she even knew God just because of her obedience and the obedience of the prophet to shift when God says shift and now he's going to be blessed and she and her son are going to live that's what I like about God is that God has so many blessings that when he blesses me and when my cup gets full my cup runneth over I wish I was in a Baptist church today and as my cup runs over there's always somebody that's going to be a saucer in my life it might be my wife and my children it might be the people in the church but one thing I understand is that as God blesses me he allows my blessings to flow to others but watch the text as it comes alive Elijah begins to talk to the widow woman and he tells her the Lord said bring me a morsel of bread first and then something begins to shift in the atmosphere because this woman that didn't even acknowledge God as being her God she does as the prophet says and Elijah says to her as the word of the Lord says that your source will not run out your meal will not run out your oil will not run out here's my last point and I'm going to stop troubling you today here's what I learned from Elijah and this text. The text teaches me that if we are willing to reposition ourselves, the Lord has a miracle that's waiting for us with our name on it. Oh, this is why I need some hand clappers, some dancers, some hand shakers, some hallelujah folks, some tear jerkers to say, yes, I'm waiting for my miracle because I believe that if I stay in the will of God, that God has a miracle with my name on it. You 
see Elijah just had to be willing to reposition his life and when he repositioned his life the Lord had a miracle waiting on him when he got in the right position well where are you going pastor here's where I'm going today if your life is in the wrong position perhaps that's the reason why you're not blessed if your life is in the wrong position perhaps that's the reason you haven't had a miracle perhaps you need a repositioning well where does repositioning take place maybe first you have to begin to repent in your life because the Lord doesn't bless sin perhaps the first thing you might need to do is say father forgive me for what I have done maybe you need to get in a different spiritual position perhaps you need to change your paradigm of thinking perhaps you have to say Lord renew my mind perhaps you have to get your mind in a new position perhaps you need to join a ministry perhaps you need to become a witness perhaps you need to become a tither perhaps you need to become a servant in the church but I declare to you today that if you get in the right position the Lord will do something in your life do I have anybody in here that can say preacher I'm a witness that if you get in the right position that the Lord will bless your life because when I look at what's happening in my life how I got my degree how I raised my children how I got a job how my marriage survived it was not on my own but it was because the Lord did a miracle in my life I need just about 50 to 100 folks today that know that they are a product of a miracle to just stand on your feet today and say I'm not ashamed to say what has happened in my life it happened because the Lord did it it happened because I repositioned myself it happened because the Lord is faithful and just is there anybody in here that can say the Lord is faithful and the Lord will bless you real good look at your neighbor and say neighbor it's time to reposition your life I'm ready to move I feel something in the atmosphere I feel like God is about to shift some things in my life I've been preaching about shifting for over a month and tell your neighbor it's time to shift right now tell your neighbor the Lord wants to do something in your life I feel a shifting coming in the atmosphere I'm willing to reposition myself I dare you this morning if you know the Lord's up to something in your life just wave your hand show some sign give him a hallelujah give him a shabak give him a praise and let somebody know you better take a good look at me now because I'm repositioning my life and if you watch my repositioning you're gonna see a miracle tell your neighbor watch me if you want to see a miracle oh come on let's worship in here tell somebody keep your eyes on me if you want to see what the Lord will do tell your neighbor if you want something to gossip about just watch my movements because I'm repositioning as the Lord speaks to me is there anybody in here that can say I feel the Lord speaking to me I've heard the Lord give me a word and now I'm ready to reposition my life if you own the move I dare you today I know we are dignified church they say we are bougie church but if you don't mind today just walk around the sanctuary just move a little bit I promise security won't bother you but if you believe that the Lord is gonna bless you real good if you need a miracle in your life if you need to be repositioned I dare you just begin to reposition yourself by moving don't wait on your dead neighbor to move don't wait on your faithless neighbor to move but tell your dead neighbor I need you to move out of my way because I heard a word from the Lord that if I just move as a sign of faith that the Lord is gonna bless my life real good is there anybody in here that needs a miracle in your life your back is against the wall you're up to your neck you're about to lose your mind the hell hounds are all over you but I declare to you if you just do something as simple as reposition your faith reposition your praise reposition your worship reposition your body that the Lord will somebody say the Lord will do a miracle in your life come here Jesus 
he was willing to reposition his life he was the son of God he was the king of glory but yet he said in order to go higher and to be in the will of the Lord I'm willing to reposition my life I wish I was in a Baptist church today and he said even though I'm the son of God I'm gonna let them put nails in my hands even though I'm the son of God I'm gonna let them put nails in my feet even though I'm the son of God they can put a crown of thorns on my head even though I'm the son of God I'm gonna let them pierce me in my side even though I'm the son of God I'm gonna let them place me in a tomb he was willing to reposition himself but look at what God did as the old church would say after three days and nights early one Sunday morning come on old Eden I need some Oregon Street Eden to say he got up with all power in heaven and in earth in my hands is there anybody in here that knows he's worthy to be praised is there anybody in here that knows that the Lord will make a way for you if you know he will if you've been a recipient of his power you ought to shout yes the Lord will make a way somehow I wish I had some real Baptists in here say the Lord will make a way somehow yes he will yes he will yes he will yes he will won't he will yes he will look down your road and say won't it 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 bless you real good hallelujah yes he will this is my last Sunday to talk about a shift tell your neighbor it's time to shift it's time to move it's time to reposition wake your dead neighbor if it's a family member somebody you in the house with the CDC says you can touch them you can rock them you can reel them but tell somebody I hear the Lord speaking and it's my time to shift tell somebody it's my time I've cried too long I've suffered too long I've fought too long I've been in lack too long tell somebody it's my time it's my time it's my time Everybody just lift your hands in the air. Lift your hands in the air. I believe this is a season of repositioning. God wants to do something different in your life, your family, your finances, your marriage, your church, your health. But you have to believe him. 
when he speaks a word to you. The prophet Elijah could have said, you know what? The Lord's been good to me all these years. I could sit here at this brook and just die at this brook. And the story would be that Elijah had a good life. And that would have been true. But Elijah had to have enough faith, intimacy, and relationship with God. To say, even though the Lord's been good and he's brought me this far. I believe the Lord still has some more he wants to do. I, I hit something. I hit something a few weeks ago. And, and the Holy Spirit just keeps me here with this word for Enoch. I, I said a few weeks ago that when you look at the Bible in the Old Testament, when shifts occur, the shifts weren't driven by the young folk. But the shifts were driven by the elder folk. I was a young preacher when I came here six years ago. I don't know what I am now, Reverend Sands. Well, I got an AARP card and everything else. But the elder folks need to drive the shift. And once the elder folks initiate the shift, when they get tired of driving the shift, then the young folks come behind them and they pick up the load. If you don't hear anything else I ever say in this church, hear this. If Enid's going to ever be what she's called to be, some folks in that Caleb generation going to say it's time to reconstruct some things. It's time to build some things. It's time to do some things differently. Let the Caleb speak in this house. The folks with the gray hair. No hair. Bob Anderson. Jesse Scott. Robert Miller. Charles Thomas. Ronald Sampson. That's the youth, that's the youth choir back there. Uh, Chestnuts. Jake Brinson. Let them stand at the altar and say it's time for us to step out in faith yet again. Not even devils will have enough sense to raise their voice up against that faith. But if we're going to be who we're called to be, we need the Caleb's to say it's not time to sit down, but it's time to shift. God's speaking to someone today and saying, your shift starts with just getting saved. Your shift starts with coming to Christ. We extend you an invitation to, to come to Christ, to be a part of the kingdom. We want you to come right now. If you're not saved, you desire to be saved, if you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, if you believe that God has assigned you to this house of worship to be planted, to grow, to be covered, to be prayed for, if God has said to you today, it's time for you to reposition your life, then uh, you need to come right now and give your heart to Jesus. I need somebody over here to look at the sound booth because they're trying to get y'all's attention and it's distracting me. So we need to help them get these sound systems done and these microphones so y'all can talk to each other. But somebody down here look at the sound booth, amen, because I'm trying to get the invitation. God wants to save someone today. If you would just come and give your life to Jesus. This is the time to be saved. This is the time to be repositioned. This is the time to give your life to Jesus Christ. Don't miss the shift in your life. And what God is trying to do in your atmosphere. Won't you come? As the choir sings or plays something softly. 
Just pray for the person around you. This is your chance. This is your opportunity to become in relationship with Jesus Christ, to be grounded and rooted with him. I believe that God wants to move in your life I believe and I know that God is speaking to someone. It's just a matter of obedience. Will you do what God has already said do? Will you shift when God asks you to shift? Will you surrender your life? Is there one here today? Won't you come to him? Amen. We see young folks coming. We want you come. To me what I have. We want you come. We want you come. This is my sin. I believe God is speaking to someone. If you come. Amen. I see others coming. I see others coming. Watch your car, watch your car. You ought to reposition yourself today. Just come. This is my to me you God wants to do something in your life if you just surrender to Him. Oh, here comes some more. Here comes some more. Here comes some more. Yeah, yeah. But I've sure been faithful. Yeah. God's moving. God's moving. God's moving. God has a purpose. Speak to you today. That is blessing. No more stressing. Won't you come? Won't you come? And I know him. Oh, I he wants to do a miracle in your life. Won't you come? Won't you come? For grace, for favor. This is my You come. This is my seat for grace, for favor. This is my seat to reap what I have sown. Yeah, this is your seed if you just believe him. I believe God's still speaking to someone else. For my if you just surrender your life, everything is working. The Lord's filled two pews with folks coming, but we got plenty of room good. at the cross. Won't you come? Everything won't you come? Everything is working together for your good. Won't you come? Won't you come? Everything is working together. For your good, this is your season for grace, for favor. This is your season. Don't miss your season. This is your season to reap what you have sown. Amen. This you is may be your season for grace. For favor, this is your seed to reap what you have Let the church say, man, bless y'all, bless y'all, bless y'all.
Oh, come on, church. Let's say amen. of young folk joining the church and coming to the Lord. We had two rows of young folk come to the... Somebody didn't hear what I said. We had two rows of young folk come to the Lord. Amen. We're grateful. Part of, part of that was a product of our youth ministry on Monday nights. Amen. Amen. To say all the time we have to continue to invest in young people and technology. Amen. If we don't, we're going to be a dead church. Amen. Amen. I'll take a pay cut to do more for technology. And did I say that? Yes, I did, didn't I? On video. Did I say that? Corey, you didn't stop me. Amen. <laughs> to take care of young folks and technology. Because that's, that's where the church is. Amen. Just a couple of things I want to put emphasis on. If you are a new disciple, a new member, you join the Enum Missionary Baptist Church anywhere during the pandemic, anywhere here recently, and you are, did not have the opportunity to go through a new disciples class, that class will be starting on next Sunday at 9 a.m. downstairs in the Murphy Greer Fellowship Hall. Amen. So if you are someone that has united with this church at any time the last two years or even before that, and you just didn't get a chance to do your new members, new disciples class. Uh, we encourage you to come downstairs beginning on next Sunday at 9 a.m. They will meet down there every Sunday until uh, further notice in that location. Amen. There's three classes in the curriculum that I've developed. The first class will be on the newness of life to teach you how uh, to live the expectations as a new believer. The second class will be upon who we are as Baptists is a doctrinal class, amen. So if you're a part of a church, you all know what the church believes. And then the third class is an orientation class on the Enon Baptist Church just to know who we are, our history, how we function, how to do certain things, how we want to minister to you. And then once you complete those three classes, you will get your membership certificate and the right hand of fellowship, amen. And those classes just repeat themselves over and over and over and over again. So if you are someone that has joined our church over the last few years and you've not had a chance to have new discipleship or new members class, uh, we hope to see you Sunday at 9.30. Uh, where's, where's Wilbur? Wilbur in here? Wilbur Jackson in here? Is he, is he outside? Uh, we need van drivers. Amen. Ooh, y'all was quiet. We need van drivers. Anyone, as the announcement said, that won't get a speeding ticket because I don't know how that looks in the trustee room if you drive the van and you get a speed. And t I never had that in 30 years of ministry. I never had to deal with that. Amen. But if you, if, you, if you got a clean driving record, if you're insurable, if you are friendly, <laughs> if you are patient, because when you are a van driver, many times you are the first introduction to our church. So if somebody gets on, someone gets on the van and they're two or three minutes late, you can't tell them, I've been waiting on you. No, no, no. If they got a child that's crying while you're driving, you got to be patient and loving. Amen. So if you have a nice, spiritual, sweet disposition, if you have a clean driving record, and if you don't drive fast like Brother Hazlip, then uh, we'll... We'll, we'll let you be in the band ministry. I'm teasing because I, I blew past him 
it was a white streak. And I just looked back, I just saw him, Miss Hayes, up in that little car. And he told me a week later, that, that was you and that little beam of flying. Yeah, it was me. But we need van drivers. We're ready to start back the van ministry. Hopefully, we can get that started back sometime around Easter or shortly thereafter. But we do need a full crew. Uh, and people are calling and requesting transportation to church that otherwise cannot get here. I had three calls myself personally that came to me personally. So we do need van drivers. You don't have to be a member of Enoch for 20 years to drive a van. Amen. As long as you got a clean record, you don't get any tickets, and you don't take the church van nowhere it's not supposed to be. Amen. You, you, can, you, you can drive the Enoch church van. Amen. Now, I have had to deal with that before. Amen. In 30 years. Amen. But we need van drivers because we need to get souls to the church, male, female. I think you got to be over. Is it over 21, Brother Thomas? Oh. Over 21, amen. So uh, see Brother Wilbur Jackson, see myself, see any one of the leaders, any of the deacons, trustees. Deacons, trustees, just wave your hand so people know who you are. And if you have an interest, uh, please, please, please see them. Uh, Terry Brown, come here real quick and say something about, about the men's day. I'll, I'll, let's give our men of Enon a hand clap of appreciation. We have our men's weekend coming up. Uh, Deacon Terry, fly guy. Brown, he's got a good itinerary set up. So let's say something about our uh, men's weekend. Praise God. Where are all the men at? Raise your hand. So this is for all the men, all the men. So this Friday, the 25th, we're having what they call men's night out. We're going to hang out right here at the church. Not at the club. We're hanging out at the church. Amen. So we're going uh, to have food catered in from Dinosaur's Barbecue. That's our physical food. Then we're going to have an inspiration video on relationships. That's our spiritual food. And we're going to have some prizes, and we're just going to fellowship and have a good time. The deadline is today. We got to get a count in. We ask for a $25 donation. If you don't have the donation, just come see one of us over here. What's that area? I don't know what that area is over there, but... Um, we don't want to turn nobody away, so just come let us know. But we asked for a twenty-five dollar donation. Yeah, Deacon Floyd got it. Yeah, Deacon Floyd got it. Deacon Floyd, where you at? Yeah. So today we need we need the list because we got to put the count in on tomorrow. So we want you to come. We want to have a nice time. The men's gonna fellowship, and ladies, if you send your man, you want to send him because he want he gonna come back change. Amen. 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 All the men of Enon, just stand up real quick so we can just celebrate you and honor you and pray for you. All the men of Enon. Amen. Look, look at this. It's, it's a lot of men in this church. Amen. Folks say there aren't men in the church, but we got a lot of men in Enon. Amen. So thank God for you. We hope to see you on Friday. Amen. Uh, just a couple of things and we'll be out of here. Uh, is the Wesson... Amen's family here today. Amen. We're going to bless our baby today. Amen. If y'all come with the baby, amen. We're going to bless this child. Amen. 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 Carrie, give us some blessing music. We're going to do this real quick. Come on, Deaconess Griffin. Oh, it's going to assist me. Oh, amen. Amen. Come on, Reverend Fraser. You help me here. this little child a hand clap of praise. This is one of the favorite things that I enjoy doing as a pastor is blessing the lives of individuals. Amen. My grandfather, I saw him pastor four generations of families in a church. And many times it's a blessing to see children grow up from infancy to adults. I saw children 
that my grandfather blessed end up taking care of him when he was a 80 year old pastor I saw children that he blessed babies become deacons and trustees in the church so I say that to say that when we bless the lives of children in the church it's sacred we don't know who they're going to become because the word of God says we are the sons of God and it does not yet appear who we shall be. All the babies I've blessed in this church, young babe, children I've blessed in this church, some of them be future leaders in this church. One of them might be my successor one day. We don't know. But as a church family, we have a responsibility to not only be that spiritual village, but to pray for these children to love these children, to cover their lives. We're glad today to have Emmanuel Mac Amons IV. Amen. Let's give little Emmanuel a hand clap of praise. We anoint the mother for her faith in bringing her child to the house of the Lord. We ask that we pray for her and the families they raise little Emmanuel. I anoint Emmanuel in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That the Lord would be a covering over his life. That he would bless him in all that he does. I anoint his hands that whatever he touches, the favor of the Lord would be upon his life and his work. I anoint his feet name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that wherever he goes, grace and mercy will follow him all the days of his life. Heavenly Father, we come right now, blessing the life of young Emmanuel Amos IV. Lord, we pray that you keep him. We pray that you preserve him. We pray that you allow him to be saved and to grow into a healthy relationship with you lord we pray that spiritual gifts and anointing will follow his life we pray that no weapon formed against his life shall ever prosper in the name of jesus we bless his life in the name of the father the son and the holy ghost so let it be i'm gonna ask if deaconess griffin would say a few words to this mother to encourage her faith. And the most, the most important thing I can tell you, and the Bible teaches us to train up a child in the way that he should go. So Emmanuel should be taught the word. Love him, spoil him, do everything possible, material for him, but teach him that word. When he goes to school, make sure the people that are around him are teaching him the right thing and that Emmanuel knows God and loves God. And when he sings his ABCs, make sure he's singing songs that are for the Lord as well. The, this little light of mine will shine. Let him know that. So teach Emmanuel the word. Give him all that he needs. And the best gift that you can give him is a gift of love because that's the greatest gift of them all. And I just want to share this moment with my first lady because I can't stand here because mothers to mothers, we know. We know what it takes to train up a child in God's word. So I'm going to leave this with my first lady to end it. We just want you to know that we praise God for you. We praise God for Lily Manuel, for your family, and we are here for you. Um, motherhood is, is the hardest thing, but it's the best blessing in the world. So we are here to support you, and we are here to support Lily Manuel, and we're going to stand by you with whatever you need. As um, Sister said here, train him up in the way that he should go, and the Lord will bless his ways. We are proud of you, and we thank God for the blessing of Emmanuel. God bless you, and we love you. Amen. You have also standing ministers from our church you have deacon gordon who's your deacon you have deaconess barrett who's over our deaconess ministry 
I believe that the church and God's people are the answer for the great majority of society's issues. You have a support network. You're not in this by yourself. So anything that this church can do, that I can do, that they can do to strengthen your life, your home, the life of your child, we are the servants of the Lord to give that to you. At this time, Deaconess Griffin is going to present you with a certificate that marks this day an occasion of when young Emmanuel's life was blessed in this church under the hand of the pastor. And she's also going to present you a New Testament Bible that we pray that you will take time and train this child in the word. Train this child in the word. Amen. That, that he will know how to walk. Amen. Enon, he done grabbed the Bible. He done grabbed the microphone. He might be my successor. Amen. Amen. I might try to retire early, Emmanuel. Amen. Let's give this family a hand clap of praise. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. It's always a blessing when people bring children to be blessed of the Lord. And as I said, that's something I love to do as the pastor. Before we have some remarks regarding our Women's History Month and the benediction, I do want to give our offertory appeal that upon your exit, our trustees and deacons will be positioned. If you want to give a physical offering today, they will greet you and receive your offering. If you want to give online, you may give online through Cash App at Enon MBC. You can do that 24-7. Amen. You know, if you're sitting at home on a Tuesday night, at 11 o'clock and you just say, boy, the Lord been good to me. Then and Sister Sandra, you can go on Cash App and, and type in $1,000 and boom, it'll go right there to the, to the Lord in the church, Sister Sandra, amen. <laughs> or you can go to our website at enonmbc.org and click on tithing or giving and that'll take you through the prompt so you can also mail your tithing offering in to 175 Genesee Street, Rochester, New York. The Lord says if we are faithful tithers that he opened the windows of heaven and pour us out a blessing that we shall not have room enough to receive it. We want the blessing of the Lord. We want to be obedient unto the Lord. We want to be cheerful givers as God has cheerfully blessed us in our lives. Amen. Amen. At this time, uh, Lady Macarons will come with some words for uh, Women's History Month and then uh, Reverend Marva Tyler who's our presider today will come with our benediction in that order doesn't she look lovely today <laughs> I talked about having more children last week and she been running from me all week <laughs> Hey, man, you got to celebrate your wife sometime, hey, amen. Isn't she lovely? Isn't she? Good afternoon. I just want to take just three minutes of your time just to encourage um, the women. Um, is that all right? All right. Women's history is the study of the role that women have played in history and the methods required to do so. It is the examination of individual and groups of women of historical significance. With this being said, women, I would like to encourage you today. As women, we have plowed, we have reaped, we have husked, we have chopped, we have picked, we have moved, we have labored, we have birthed, we have married, we have raised, we have opened, we have closed, we have taken, we have given, we have cared for, we have nurtured, we have done with, we have done without, we have made something out of nothing, we have laughed, we have cried, we have encouraged, we have fought for hours, we have tirelessly worked, we have nursed, we have written, we have lived, 
We are history. Has history not proven women are the full circle? Within us is the power to create, to nurture, and to transform. Continue to inspire like Michelle. Continue to lead like Harriet. Continue to write like Maya. Continue to represent like Maxine. Continue to build like Madam C.J. Walker. Continue to challenge like Rosa. Continue to speak like Sojourner. And continue to serve like Condoleezza. It's important you know that you can't turn back and change your beginning, but you can start where you are and end and change your end. Realize there is no force equal to the woman determined to rise. Have some fire. Be unstoppable. Be a strong force of nature. Be better than you're used to be and don't stop until you do it. Where there is no struggle, there is no strength. So never get discouraged by your struggles. Remember to keep striving and realize what you do does make a difference. You have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. I want to encourage you, women of Enon, women of everywhere, to discourage the power you hold inside to free yourself from the past to ignite challenge in the present, and to create the future your deepest dreams and hearts desires. Because I know that you can do just that. If it doesn't challenge you, it won't change you. Women, you are history. You are her story. Show and tell the world yours. I love you with sisterly love, women, Happy Women's History Month. God is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures through all generations. I don't know about you, but I'm full. You know when God sends you a word. You know when the Spirit speaks. And it's been speaking loud and clear. My grandmama and them, when they would go to church, there would be one thing that they would ask of the preacher. Is there, is there a word from the Lord? And we have received a word from the Lord. What you do with it is up to you. But you, we have received a word from the Lord. Reposition. Mmm. Mmm. Reposition. Then when he said the elders are going to have to do what they got to do. And they're going to have to move too. And it said, when it gets too heavy, that's when the young are going to move into position and push it through. We all got to do what God is calling us to do. And I thank him for that. I thank him for that. Oh, it's a glorious day. I don't know if you're as full as I am, but I believe what God says to do. And I'm willing. Now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with you now and forever. All in agreement, say amen.